we create thoughts and ideas around which thousands of people become involved. One has to marshal and take on board many, many different views, so each time it's a very, very dynamic relationship you have with the world. Creating human environments within what will be a changing scale, I think is the biggest thing that faces architects now. You have to find means of creating humanity in the, in the fact that actually that city that you're being attracted to is going to have to change quite radically to deal with the future populations. When you first begin to look at particularly disparate sites, you realise that you're having to make buildings that can somehow respond to existing context. So you have to find a narrative as to how it exists precisely where it is, and it has to also be able to deal with the future. Bankside probably represented one of the most difficult uh, urban design studies that I've, I've been involved with because there's nothing about the context which is consistent. The primary streets define the geometry. So the geometry is something which we haven't imposed. We've had to work back and find ways in which we can create systems. That's the thing that gives integrity in the language of the building. One of the joys for us as a user is that in everything, the quality of everything is so high. We, we would rather use simple materials, beautifully coordinated. There's an industrial path to this site. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, sometimes, I mean, it's not a metaphor I use a great deal, but it's kind of gasometers next to the power station. What we're fascinated in is really celebrating industrial craftsmanship, and it's trying to find a way of humanizing that because all of these pieces have been lovingly made. Not for one second, uh, approaching the, the, the building, walking over the bridge or coming up Southwark Street, coming up the lift, walking along the corridor, seeing you know, the exposed steelwork and the concrete. Not at one point have I thought, I'm getting bored with this. It's so clever and, and I just think it, you know, it looks great. The interesting thing about Lloyds of London is it was so out there, it's totally impossible to copy and it demystified the whole concept of how we view buildings. It's not an art piece, it's the power of the diagram and the relentless way in which it's been pursued and throughout all of its organisational detail but also its pieces, beautifully made. There's nothing in Lloyds of London that's superfluous. Everything is doing something. But that level of elemental expression would be very difficult to pull off in today's market. But I think it'll still be functioning in 50 years time and it will still be as unusual and provocative as ever. We are fascinated by site and context. We're not into necessarily a utopian solution for everywhere. Lloyd's was built by the cottage industry, by genuine artisans, not by big conglomerates. And that was a fascinating experience. It was very clear to me when I started working on it that it was like nothing else. We love working with the materiality. What we don't like is the idea that it's, it's a pure art, you know, it's, that, that you construct an image. And it is a genuinely flexible place. It comes from technology, this idea that the most flexible place you can make, you want as little interruption or intrusion into that space that you can get. 
you need to have great clients and great clients need to work with you and together you produce architecture. For the Maggie Centre, we had a very urban site and the task was really to find a sort of tranquil place within that environment. The solution, I guess, started with the idea of a sort of spiral form, a, a nautilus shell or snail, where in a hostile environment, there's some comfort to be found right at the heart of that organization. And yet, it still makes a connection with the outside world. We really took the idea and saw how far we could stretch it, but still make sure that the concept was very strong and allow it to be constructed in a sort of understandable way. That legibility is you know, something that is consistent in the practice and something that is as important in Maggie's with its slightly more conventional use of material than it would be in, let's say, a um, Leadenhall building. One of the biggest things for people is actually to walk over the threshold. Yes. Because on some level, when they're coming to Maggie's, because Maggie's is synonymous with cancer, they're very much aware that they're, it becomes real. When we were thinking about how we design the interior and how you, you, know, you could always see from room to room, um, you know, we know that the sliding doors are important as part of that, this feeling that you're not slamming the door on someone. One of the things I really like about, about this particular centre is the fluidity mm. and how that affects the dynamics of the centre because people can find their own space. And I think there are lots of lovely spaces where people are contained in their own space and in a way their own world, but actually they're part of the whole. As architects, we have to be careful. We're not artists, but at the same time, we are more than just assemblers of industrial mechanistic components. I detest the idea of styling things. I like things to evolve, become what they become through time. Building begins to formulate itself into a sort of physical presence. This is what architecture is about, is about making place and space for people. I don't see it as a way of demonstrating aesthetic ideals. I imagine what places are like, that's what goes on in my head. Baracus is one of, you know, it's a 21st century airport. We have this system, the componentized building. The colors arranged in a rainbow. So as you look along the building, you can see, if I get to yellow, I know I'm in the middle. It's a sort of wayfinding device as well. I'd rather make a building that excites comment, however positive or negative, than a building that excites nothing. We're always on the lookout for new ways of doing things, of achieving things. Graham is an absolute genius. His work ethos and the way he works with his teams in a very sort of collective manner as a sort of a great conductor, with a massive attention to detail from the nuts and bolts to the very general. The way that he analyzes a site, the way that he brings a building together to emerge out of almost what you see as an impossible task to something which has a, a sort of poetry in terms of you know, geometry and scale. I tend to explore ideas using logical analysis, but I still have to dream up the idea. I used to make amazing cardboard structures as a child. I used to do some very, very odd things. My grandfather was a magician who made all of his own kind of dolls, props and various other things. I've always been very practical and, you know, as a kid in the countryside, we used to break up old cars, service them, get them running on the road. I love just making and investigating and, and actually building stuff. I think Ivan and I share the same values. The main thing we share is, is trying to arrive at clarity. It's about the architecture coming out of an enjoyable process of discussion and desire and affordability and deliverability, all these things that you need to make something actually happen. Richard has set up a sort of ethos for the place, which is extremely enjoyable to work in. I feel very comfortable in it. We have a constant belief that we can make people's lives better. I think that's what drives us. The world is going through urbanisation, and architecture has big responsibility in that way to make those cities better for people.